Hey, what is up? This is Jake with Exodus, and today we have a video version of our podcast, Trail Cam Radio. It is with Perry Russo Silvio from Michigan. Now, Perry is a really interesting guest. He was a regional director for the Quality Deer Management Association, has done studies on the King Ranch in Texas, and really good conversation. We dive into a lot of different things, uh, hunting east winds, how deer travel across um, particular parcels, and uh, dissecting different pieces of public ground, and just really good conversation. Barry has a lifetime uh, value of knowledge that he was sharing with us. So really hope you guys enjoy it. He's written a book before and it's called Walking On, Why Attitude, Servitude, and Gratitude Trump Everything Else in Life. Um, you can find that in the description below. Uh, we'll link to that. And just finishing up a food plot here, bone dry here in Illinois, but we're hoping we get some rain. We actually have the farmer using the irrigator, but you won't turn on the one that's going to help us out. So anyways, hope everyone's doing safe uh, during this time. And let's get into the video. Lights. Camera. Follow the trail. I'm ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. All right, we're live here in Michigan. This is the last leg of the tour here. And uh, when we laid this out, I was very excited, but it has exceeded my expectations. Um, we started John Eberhardt. We're ending here with Perry. Thank you for inviting us into your home. Yep. Um, kind of hearing your stories while recording the Whitetail Cribs. It was, it was great. We said, we have some time. Let's sit down and record a podcast. And... Um, when we show up to some of these, I didn't know that, I'll be completely honest, I didn't realize who was inviting us into their home. And uh, it's it's been a really cool um, surprise. So I'm not going to botch your past history. I'm going to let you kind of explain who you are, um, what did you do for uh, work, and we'll just start talking about whitetails. Well, I've always been, <clears throat> grew up in an outdoor family, really. My dad really didn't like uh, hunting. My grandfather was the big, my mom's dad was the big hunter, you know, and uh, I started out rabbit hunting and bird hunting. What actually got me hooked into the hunting sports was uh, pheasant hunting when I was a real young kid and uh, was probably about eight, nine years old. And, you know, my dad would uh, would bring us out there on opening day of pheasant season and opening day here in Michigan is like, you got to wait till 10 o'clock and then, you know, you can go out into the field. And uh, back then we had a lot of pheasants and uh, it was always exciting. And my grandfather used to take these big, like, uh, diaper pens. They were, like, this big around, and, you know, he'd put them on our, on our belts, and they would shoot a bird. And I remember me and my brother carrying these birds, and there'd be, like, ten guys, and the, the, the birds would be more than we, what, what we weighed, and we would just be dragging <laughs> all these birds. You know, we just, and that's what got me hooked. And then as I got a little older, my dad bought us uh, hockey equipment. And he wanted us to play hockey so bad. So, you know, it was Gordy Howell and, you know, Bobby Orr. And he was, and I didn't have the love for hockey. I mean, I wanted to go hunting. I mean, I wanted to go. That's all I wanted to do was go hunting and fishing. So my dad, as I got older, he goes, I never dreamed that you kids would be, you know, uh, turned into the hunting sports more so than all. I was a jock growing up. I mean, I played uh, like my brother. I mean, we played uh you know, hardball, we played football, we, I ran track, I played basketball, you know, all the way through high school. But my real love, I remember my basketball coach in high school, you know, telling me that if you take a week off, uh, you'll be sitting the bench. And I went in and gave him my uniform. <laughs> 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 See, I got a family tradition. I'm going hunting with my family up to the UP, you know, rifle hunting. I said, I'm not, I'm not missing. If I sit the bench, I'm fine. I'll just give you my uniform now. <laughs> so... <laughs> But uh, that kind of uh, taught me, uh, I think, you know, in those early years, you know, uh, that I did have a little bit of moxie. I just didn't know how much I had. And uh, not that I've been a person that, uh, you know, uh, would just go after things, but I just know what was right and wrong. I just knew that what we had, two million whitetails in, in Michigan buying our farm, and uh, Jeff Sturgis used to come out, and we'd have, like I say, 170, 200 whitetails would come out in our front and back pasture, and there wouldn't be one antlered buck. And so uh, they were starting back then. This was like uh, late 80s, you know, really trying to get some. There was another movement, 
uh, that I got tied into and met a couple of guys in the thumb and they were trying to get state laws changed. But then, you know, they got convinced to let it go a year and do some education. And we went about, you know, to about 1992, somewhere right in there. And then I got involved with uh, QDMA and I started the second branch in Michigan, which was the thumb area branch and a very successful branch here in Michigan. And uh, one thing just led to another. I mean, I became the regional director for for them and uh, traveled around for several years. It was a it was probably, you know, my greatest job, my greatest experience, uh, made so many friends. Uh, you know, my tenure there was cut a little short, but uh, I, I still feel like it was a total bonus to everything that I've, I've come to know and the friendships that I've made. And, you know, some of the success that I've had here in Michigan didn't come from me. It came from a lot of uh, other people that uh, gave me the help. You know, you got the Jim Strader, Jamie Strader, uh, Jeff Strader, uh, Paul Plantinga. You know, there's a number of people that were very instrumental about how we uh, drove the philosophy in terms of deer management, you know, in a different direction. Even though it's probably in our state, it's still 50-50. You know, 50% are for some kind of, you know, APR restriction or some kind of enhanced deer management program. And the other 50% is, I don't, I just want to go shoot deer, you know, so it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh one thing that was pretty interesting that um, as we were talking, you actually did some work. Uh, was that with the QDMA at, down at the King Ranch? Was that in association yeah, we, with Yeah, uh, me and Kip Adams, actually, we um, <clears throat> we flew into um, Atlanta, and we drove over to Watkinsville. We drove our company van because we both were regional directors at the time, and uh, we drove all the way to uh, the Callahan Ranch in Texas. And then Brian Murphy and the rest of the crew, they all flew. And so we had to drive all the gear, you know, so we were the, we were the, the, the gear jockeys, the gear jockeys. <laughs> and, uh, so that was a, a, a great trip. And, uh, we got to see, uh, firsthand, you know, how they really collect data on, it was a special study that they had for seven years. And it was a certain, I think it was like 60 bucks that they tagged as fawns and they had a little chip. Uh, behind her ear and this little you know computer wand you know once you got the the buck kind of uh you know shot with a net and you cobble them and get them down on the ground tied up with a face mask over their head uh you kind of you know wave the wand it tells you all the data that's already on the deer that they've collected before in the past from years past and then you're putting in the data that you're collecting that year so it's not just antler dimensions it's weight it's tooth wear it's all different kinds of things you know, that they put into that data. And it gives them an idea about, you know, uh, the home range of the deer. It gives them, you know, body weights because they take the body weights, not just the, the antler d dimensions, but it tells them an awful lot that otherwise they would not have, you know. So I think uh, that probably, uh, of all the whitetail things that I've done, that's probably the most exciting, hopping out of the back end of a car, jumping on top of a buck by his antlers and tackling them <laughs> and bringing them down to the ground. I mean, that was that was spectacular, I got, got to say. And, and even, you know, uh, Brian had said to me, you, you know, at your age, you sure you want to do this? I said, are you kidding? I want to do that. I'm gonna, I, was for, I was like 46. I think I was 46 or 47. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this all day long. I'm not sure it gets more much more Western than that. That's that's yeah. pretty, that, we that were pretty with wild. forty cowboys, and I want to tell you they were real cowboys, the real deal. Oh yeah, these guys were rough and tough. So where I mean through those seven years, how often was that data collected or in, input on on those chips? every year? But it wasn't every year that you'd be able to collect data on that buck because you may not be able to capture them. Right. You know. Okay. So okay. you got these little helicopters, and they fit into the back of your pickup. And uh, you're shooting a 308 that was designed in New Zealand. And it shoots, a, uh, I think, an eight, six by eight net. And uh, they're just, the helicopters, you know, just that far over the top of the back of that buck. And they just shoot them with the net. And they're, most of the time, they tumble, they get tangled up, and they're already on the ground. But a lot of times, if they just get them on their antlers, then they're just standing there. And you got to jump out of the truck in the Sendero and <laughs> tackle them, bring them down, and... So that was a lot of fun. Where is there a is there a um, publication where people can find that? Find that I would think QDMA would have uh, some kind of link, uh, all tied into um, L Brothers, 
you know, who's the, the real father of the movement of, you know, whitetail management. And, uh, of course, we spent, uh, you know, a day with him at his place. And, uh, you know, so much uh, of the whitetail research has come out of Texas. Yeah. You would think that out of all the research that was done by Azoga and Vermi here in Michigan, that uh, that it would really be the, the shining light. But as Michigan restored other states, other states actually took it to another level. So you had Texas, you know, with the same kind of problems that Michigan had in terms of uh, deer numbers, population, but their population dynamics was, was totally off the charts uh, in comparison to, let's say, the upper Midwest or the, or the rest of the United States. And, of course, then you go to Pennsylvania when Gary Alt was there, and he was in the forefront trying to change what Michigan was trying to change. And uh, having to leave his tenure became short because, you know, you're trying to change a philosophy of uh, how do we make money and still keep guys happy? Well, sell them two tags and let them shoot as many bucks as they possibly can. That's kind of the philosophy that we have in the U.S. But, you know, as I've gotten older, you know, going to hunting in uh, – uh, Montana and hunting in uh, Iowa this past year. And I had spent some time in Iowa when I was a regional director for QDMA. I had, had traveled through there uh, coming back from seminars and whatnot. And I can tell you that, uh, you, know, heck, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the philosophy there was the same that it is now. And uh, it's not that, uh, and it's not, I want to say uh, emphatically that it's not shaming other hunters into not shooting a smaller, younger deer. It's just that they want the health of the deer herd to be at an age class that makes sense, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, for them, I mean, it's like, yeah, they shoot big bucks. But they, I got, I've been to a place uh, that I didn't hunt there, but I got to meet somebody that's a landowner there, and they shoot as many does as they possibly can. So I, I think management as a whole, uh, it's, a, it's a positive. It just depends you know, what part of the country you're in. You know, uh, Texas is like uh, very unusual because you as a landowner can write your own prescription and say, well, you know, I've got this amount of property. I've got this amount of bucks in this age class. I've got this amount of does. I've got this many bucks in this age class. I, I want to take out this many does. I want to take out this many bucks. They, they just write you the, the ticket. Mm-hmm. You can't do that in any, in any other state. No. Mm-hmm. You know, you no. don't have that that freedom. Yeah. So they, the biggest problem we have in state agencies is they feel like you're going to uh, wreak havoc on uh, the ecosystem because you're doing the managing. No, you're too dumb to do the man. No, believe me, the hunters are the, are the smartest deer managers there, they are, that there is. It's not the biologists, not that they don't help us, but they're not out there pulling the trigger. They're not out there hunting. They're not out there doing habitat improvement. You know, we're the guys doing the habitat improvement. We spend more earned dollars than any other segment of the population when it comes to conservation. Yeah. So well, when I when someone makes that argument to me, that's my argument. Yeah. Well, to your point, uh, there's a couple of things I want to touch base on that you mentioned. But to your point, squeezing the trigger, whether that's letting a, a, a bullet fly or letting an arrow fly, that's the ultimate that's the ultimate management decision, whether or not to, you know, take that resource off the land to to harvest Mm -hmm. that animal. I mean, at the end of the day, that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but to circle back a little bit, one of the things that I've often asked myself when you start talking about, um, the research in Texas and how Texas was, you know, I guess on the forefront of that, why is it that, you know, when people think of whitetail hunting, they think about the Midwest, they think about Illinois, they think about Mm -hmm. Iowa, they think about Ohio. You're, um, I mean, obviously Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, the heritage there is unmatched probably anywhere. But when people think about whitetails, they think about mm-hmm. the Midwest states. But on the scientific side, when you start looking at research, you look at Dr. Carl Miller at University of Georgia, yeah, you look at right. Mississippi State. Why is it the South is 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 doing that work? But when people think about whitetails, it's the Midwest. Is there a disconnect there or is it just? I, I think that after Michigan did a lot of the restoration throughout the United States, that the southern states – uh, really saw the whitetail resource as a commodity, okay? And the states like Michigan, they don't see the the whitetail resource in, in that light. What they look at is, you know, 
they know they have 700, 800,000 hunters that say gun hunters. And most of those are weekend warriors, guys who come from the city. And that's not saying that's bad, but, you know, they may only, they might not even go up on opening day, you know, because, you know, their job doesn't allow them to take that time off because well, however the, the 15 falls is, you know, you got to wait till the, they got to wait till the weekend. So they're like a weekend warrior, you know what I mean? And there's like in our state by, you know, shoot two bucks and, you know, most guys are happy, you know, but you go, let's say down to Georgia now where the philosophy has totally changed, where guys aren't happy with shooting two bucks. They want to shoot one good one and then manage the resource and then also manage the habitat. You know, you go to uh, Nebraska, you go to Kansas, you go to anywhere kind of like out towards the upper Midwest, right? Totally different way of looking at the whitetail resource. But the southern states, like I I would say like right now for the last uh, three to five years, uh, Kentucky has probably been the sleeper. The guys are starting to read more and more about, and why is that? All of a sudden, they're realizing that the age structure is there. And the argument here in Michigan is I see this, I've been seeing the same arguments year after year after year after year after year of the Michigan Outdoor Forum um, when it comes to the Whitetail Forum. And, you know, that is, you know, they get to, to hunt whatever they want. But when you go to another state and the resource is better, if I'm retired like I am now, right, I don't want to spend my money in Michigan when I can go to Iowa, when I can go to Kentucky, and when I can go to Ohio, or I can go to Missouri, and I can get just tenfold times, you know, the experience. It's not the harvest. It's the experience that I'm after. And then I have 63. Okay, let's say I got 20 more good years of hunting left, right? <laughs> Probably not. I want to get as many of those good years. I can't get it here in Michigan. So where am I going to go? I'm going to go to a state like Kentucky. I'm going to go to a state like Missouri where I can walk in as a non-resident, go pay my fee, go to state ground that offers me better than what I can do here at home. Right. Yeah. And it's not that far. I mean, I'm within seven to nine hours to go hunt somewhere somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And so Michigan loses out on all those dollars. It's not just hunting dollars. It's gasoline. It's restaurants. Local it's economy. clothing. It's sporting goods. It's It's all of it. Yeah. 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 A lot of, a lot of money that, um, you know, people think of the whitetail industry and it's always product categories, right? It's always, right. it's always clothing, tree stands, bows, but yeah. when you roll into a campground, a state campground, yeah. November 2nd, and there's 500 people there, you think about the gas stations, yeah. the, the mom and pop restaurants. Cross, yep. I mean, there's, there's a lot there for local economies to, to really draw in. Right. Um, I guess let's, uh, Let's start switching switching gears a little okay. bit. There's, um, you know, while we were shooting this Whitetail Cribs episode, there was just a, you're a very knowledgeable guy. I've been doing this for a long time. We, I mean, we have the opportunity to, t- to go around and talk to a lot of different people in the industry. Um, not only in the industry, but some very, very good hunters and killers, guys that are killing good deer everywhere they go, very efficient. But there's some things that you were talking about that, um, you're really? very unique, yeah. Yeah, unique, piqued my interest in things that that may, maybe were worded a little bit different or that I have not even heard of. So I want to start talking about some yeah. of this. Um, Jake, you have a list of list of some stuff, like yeah. top to bottom. Let's First thing when we do, came in here that caught my attention was hunting east winds. Um, most people aren't set up for an east wind, but I do agree in the sense of in Illinois, there's a lot of – between the dates of like November 8th and 11th, there's usually an east wind out of those three or four days. Um, is that something that you've seen or when you're saying those east winds, are you thinking any east wind, it could be early season, rut, late season? If I have, if I know the night before that I'm getting an east wind and I was working, I would take that day off. <laughs> okay. I mean, 1,000% I'm taking that day off. And the reason being is because like if you're hunting uh, an older buck, I, th- I think the way I explained it to you guys is like he's on a, a regular routine, especially early season. You're not going to change his pattern, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, an east wind is not a typical wind. We get, if you look at data, we have just as many south winds as we have northwest winds, okay? But when we get that occasional east wind, if you see a buck, let's say he's in, I was ex- kind of describing a scenario for you guys. Let's say he's in a south 
uh, let's say is in a southeast corner, okay, in the morning. You see him feeding, right? You really can't go hunting, but you see him. Well, I'm going to go hunt him, and I'm going to kill him probably that day. And that if it's an east wind, I'm going to kill him on that northwest corner, especially if I know the intel on him. So I always say to guys, you know, always pick my brain. I says, I get as much intel as I possibly can on a buck, and I'll put myself in the best spot, and I really don't care about the wind because I'm going in there to kill him. I'm not, you know, if if I wanted to play tiddlywinks with him, I just would stay on the outside <laughs> outside edge and try to get him when he's coming out or trying to get him, you know, on an evening hunt. No, that's, that's not working. You got to have, my philosophy has always been, is, has always been more on an aggressive side than s- sitting back. I'd rather go into his bedding area, and I've killed a lot of bucks in bedding areas. This buck I hunted in Iowa, I killed him. He actually came back to his bed, which is another story. But um, I like going in and being right on the fringe. Like a buck that I'm set up on uh, right now, he's probably five, six years old. He's about 15 minutes from here, and I didn't hunt him last year. And I'm going to hunt him on an east wind this year is how I have this whole thing set up. When that east wind comes in, the first east wind, I'm probably going to get a sighting at least if I don't kill him. So I expect to kill him on an east wind. But here's the thing. He's like a creature of habit, like on Sunday going to church. You go to the same pew, you sit at the same spot. He's sleeping in one or two, three beds that he has, let's say in a 40-acre woodlot that he frequents all the time. And now he wants to, he's got a, a wind that's really kind of screwed him up, and he really doesn't want to change his pattern. It's about the only time that I feel that a deer will change his pattern or do what they call, he'll cross the wind instead of going directly north, you know, north or north or south or east or west, like on an east wind. So I'm going north, he's going to maybe go northwest on an angle. Well, that's how I shot that four-year-old I was explaining to you. I knew I'd never hunted the interior of that 40-acre woodlot, but I knew that in the evenings I would see him in that northwest corner, I knew that I could, on an east wind, I could kill him because he wasn't going to get my scent. So I went in there real aggressive. I was on an inside corner, but I was about 160 yards, actually, from the inside corner. And I shot him. In fact, when I took my friend in the following day to show him what tree I was in, he goes, I've hunted that woods since I was a little boy. He says, I would have never picked that tree. He says, yeah. I said, most guys would never pick that tree. I said, but I picked that tree for a reason. I knew that that deer was going to either cross or cut in front of me, and I wasn't going to get a shot. So I said, it was a 50-50 shot. And I said, I, I shot him at like, Four o'clock. I said to my wife, she's sitting right in the room there. I says three thirty. I says east wind. I said I'm gonna, I'm going to shoot him tonight. <laughs> I, just, I, four, I was gone forty five minutes. I says he's already dead. They already sent her a picture from my phone. So do you think? Okay. So I guess let's die. Let's yeah. let's elaborate on this a little bit because I'm still trying to wrap my my mind around exactly what's going on. So an east wind is a very uncommon wind uncommon. for a lot of different places. Um, and usually it takes some kind of big coastal storm or maybe something mm-hmm. dropping. I don't even know, maybe dropping from Canada. It might be a little bit different here, but I'm trying to you know, think in terms of where we are uh, in Ohio. So you have an east wind. Most of the time, you know, from what I see, and again, this you might have a different opinion on this, but deer are bedding in locations where they have that wind blowing across their back. They have side or some kind mm-hmm. of um, security cover and they can visually see kind of out in front of them, whether that's an edge of a swamp, uh, you know, upper one third hill country, whatever. Are you saying the deer, they're still bedding, I guess, in the same types of areas or those same mm-hmm. three beds, but with that wind, they don't have, because it happens. So I guess it's not very frequent that they don't have a necessary, they don't really have a pattern for that East wind. And it kind of throws them off being vulnerable. Is that what? Yeah. I mean, m- most deer, when they're out feeding at night, okay. If they if they're betting like on a southeast corner, mm-hmm. okay, they're going to get up in the middle of the day, twelve. One, I mean, a, a buck's getting up. He's not yes. laying there all day. He's right. he's getting up at least two or three times. Yep. Okay, he's milling around. He may walk an edge every once in a while. You'll get a glimpse of him, but most of the time he's on the interior. He's not going to walk that far. He's going to make a big circle. He's either going to come back to his bed or bed down somewhere in between. Now, if you hunt that same buck. 
and you're trying to hunt them from the west, you really can't hunt them from the west because you're always, if you hunt them from the west, you're always going to educate them. Mm -hmm. If you try to hunt them from the south, you're always going to educate them. You got to, you know, it's like I prefer to sit, especially on morning hunts, I prefer to sit at home then go out, then educate the buck that I'm after. Because I know that if I slip in at 1 o'clock, there's a good chance I'm going to shoot him between 2 and 4. And I've, I've made that happen so many times. So the biggest key is uh, the east winds are such an off-throw to a buck's. He doesn't, he's not used to it all the time. But he'll toler- he, it's tolerable to him. What he doesn't tolerate is you let's say three times during the week, hunting that spot, you know you shouldn't be hunting, and he knows you're there, and he's, ne- he's never going to give you a shot. Right. You know, and you're just going to spook him out of there. Mm-hmm. So I would say you probably, like a lot of guys feel, I think, they give up mornings, but I probably give up more mornings than anybody. And I'll go in midday. I'll go in at 10 o'clock. You know, I'll go in. I know when they're already bedded and sl- slip in and then try to get out. The wind shifts, and I'm out of there. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty mobile, always have been, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm just not going to educate them. I had a buck that, uh, we called freight train, uh, at our farm and, uh, I wanted to shoot so bad. He was friggin' just a, just a friggin' freak and, uh, never got a chance to shoot him. And, uh, but, uh, he was a buck that had a huge home range. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So with those East winds, do you see deer, those bucks ever moving with tailwinds? Are they always kind of quartering two? How do you see that movement happening with those? Most with those? of them, it's either north or south. Mm-hmm. They're either traveling north or they're traveling south on an east wind because they're getting a crosswind, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, you know, they'll say that a, a buck won't walk with the wind at his back. No. <laughs> <laughs> they do it all the time. Yeah. and uh, But you just have to be – it's like um, – there's certain bucks that we were talking about earlier. There's certain bucks that, that I feel like uh, you see a buck that you know that's not in your area as a floater buck. You want to go after him, but you go, oh, I'm just going to hunt the edge. You know, I, know he's, I don't want to push him out of this woodlot. He's the only buck that really doesn't know that woodlot. Okay? Now's the time to be aggressive, go in there from whatever direction, get in there and set up and sit on him all day. He's going to get up and mill, mill around. That's... <laughs> That's something like we talk about non-core core bucks or, you know, bucks that come through during the rut that are strange, like neighbor, you know, un, unfamiliar bucks. They're but, from two miles. They're from a mile, right. two miles, three miles away. But the point that you just made that like this is such a common sense thing, like that buck doesn't know those woods. He His home range is two miles away. He's showing up on a hot doe or whatever got into him. Last he, year, I'm sitting in my tree stand, right? It's 10 o'clock in the morning and I've been watching this 140 buck. Okay, on lockdown at the corner of this field back behind my property, which I had permission to hunt on, right? I, am I going to sit here or am I going to make a stalk? So this uh, ditch is like 10 feet, 12 feet. It's like a dike. It's like 12 feet deep. And I'm walking the bottom of it. It's only like six, eight inches of water. I walked all the way around a half a mile. I got within 40 yards. And my wife saw me out there and she said, all of a sudden, I see this big deer running across the field, and she goes, then I saw a guy out there. I go, well, that guy was me. <laughs> <laughs> I go, that guy was me. You know, I didn't get a shot at him, but I got close. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I was trying to make, I was, I took the risk. I got caught, but at the same time, I'd have never, I'd have never got that close, sitting there waiting on him on, lock, on lockdown on a doe. A doe never got out of her bed. He never, he, he stood in like, within a five-foot area that whole morning. I mean, you just have to be aggressive. I mean, Roger Roth here uh, taught me that many, many years ago. He said, if you're in your stand, you see a buck, and you see him go bed down, go make a stalk on him. Yeah, go get him. Go get him. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah. – um, do you have anything in particular, Jake? Because there's a okay, – that covers my question on on the that southwest, northwest, that mm-hmm. corner strategy that, you know, we we both have written down. I like to call it opposite corner. Right, opposite corner. I like to call it opposite corner. I talked about this many years ago in some of my seminars that I gave. And, um, you know, in that country, you always see deer. It's like just because you see them in this one spot, you know, in the morning, 
if you really pay attention, a lot of times you don't see that same deer in the, in the same spots in the morning as you do in the evenings. Yeah. So you got to kind of keep track, you know, where those bucks are traveling because then you can kind of put point A and point B together, you know, and it's like common sense. Okay, he's here, you know, a couple of times a week in the morning, and then, but I always see him out in that field, you know, at night over here. Well, okay, you got to set up a strategy. And, you know, most guys would say walk – the biggest mistake I feel that most guys make, even guys that do habitat improvement, is they talk about, you know, using your property, walk the edge of your, you know, your ag fields to get to, you know, your spot. Totally disagree. Uh, you have to be, if you know you have a buck and you know you have a pattern that you want to go after, you can't walk that field's edge. Because if you walk that field's edge, no matter where he comes out, he's going he's gonna to smell you. I want to give him the least amount. Okay, so if my, if, let's say. <laughs> We're getting ready to draw a diagram here. Yeah. Let's say this is an 80, okay? And this is all corn. This is corn. This is beans back here, okay? And I know the, the bedding area is right here, Okay. I'm not going to walk this edge. I'm not going to walk this edge. I'm not going to walk this edge because he's feeding in all these other spots, okay? Where do I want to do? I want to park up close to where he's bedded. So I'm going to walk from, let's say it's from the road, I'm going to walk straight to my stand that's 30 yards in right there. I'm going to get within 80 yards of him. That's where I'm going to go. I'm going to give him the least amount of spot to smell me. The wind's in my favor. I'm, a, I'm hunting a northwest wind, right? North, northwest, east, and south. I'm going to get there. I'm going to sneak in stealthy. I'm probably one of, the, one of the most stealthiest hunters you ever met in your life. And I guarantee you, I'll slip in, and I'm going to, I'm going to put the a herd on him. That, that's my whole goal. I'm not going to give him a chance to smell me when he comes out at night and smell all that path. No, mm -hmm. he's got to be out in that bean field to cut maybe one path. Right. And he's not, probably not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. <laughs> like a, that's a common sense that's a common sense approach to I mean limit limit your ground scent limit the ability for them to cut your track and right. understand that they're being hunted. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I've I've quite heard that explanation to go. I mean, I mean, I guess depending on who we talk to, we maybe we we've had her, heard it once or twice. Um, Think about if you're hunting. Just think if this was a cornfield, right? The rows are running this way. Yep. Okay. A deer, when he comes out of the woods, he's going to come in. They come in three rows, and what do they do? They follow the row. They yep. follow the row. Yep. And then that's when you start seeing all the damage, right? Yep. So why would I, why would I want to cut this all the way down that edge, all the way around this food source? I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to let them know. I've got to go in between all these rows to get to my spot. Yep. Okay, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give him the minimum amount of smell that I have, residual smell, you know, that he's going to find. But he's not going to find me here. He's not going to find me blowing where he's at. Which way bedded. do you think you'd get up out of his bed? Where, which way do you think you would go with the northwest wind there? With that North, surrounding? south, east, and west, okay? In most cases, if he's bedded here, depending, if he's got a south wind, and there's a food source over here, he may go south, okay? But in most cases, if it's a northwest wind, he's going to travel just like this. This is what I have found through the years. He's going to travel this edge within eyesight of the edge, within 60 yards, and he's going to travel just like this. He's going to do a half moon. He's going to come out to this corner. He's going to come out somewhere out here in this lower third. Not all the way to the corner, but this lower third. And that's kind of how I set up my stands when I find a good buck. Um, like the buck I'm hunting right now that, I, that I'll be hunting, he's in a big swamp. And this is probably 240 acres, roughly. And over here, this is all private on this side, no egg. No egg, no egg, no egg. Just a big swamp. It's a big cedar swamp. A lot of water. 
comes down through this, breaks off, breaks off, and then there's a little stream that comes in like this. I have a road that comes up here like this. I've got to go in. His bed is right here. Okay, these are uh, oak ridges. It runs kind of like a, kind of winding down, you know, like that. And uh, when you come down off of this ridge, it goes down probably a good 40, 50 feet, you know, down to that water level because it's all cattails and swamp and mm -hmm. cedars and tamarack and stuff like that. And uh, I'm going to slip in. From this one, I'm going to walk in the road, I'm going to walk up this fence line, and I'm going to walk straight to within 60 yards of his bed. That's where my setup is at. I only have two setups for him. I have one here, and I have one down here. Are those pre-trimmed trees to hunt out of a saddle? Or? Yeah, okay. pre-trimmed trees to hunt out of a saddle. And where he's bedded, he'll never see me on an east wind. Mm-hmm. And he's going to get up. He's going to walk this edge like he always does. He's got huge rub lines that go this way up this ridge, okay, coming up and over to the other ridge. And I know that I'm going to get within a probably a 30 or 40-yard shot mm -hmm. of this buck right here, you know. So any east wind throughout the deer season, you think hunters should make it a priority to be out there? Yeah. Any, That's, whether it's. But there's been more written about it that it's bad uh, because usually those east winds are really strong. Because usually it's a big st a storefront uh, that's coming through. Mm -hmm. Now, the day before those storms come through, you'll see that the wind is is south, but now it's coming east. is not strong, but before that storm hits, that's when you need to be in that for that east wind. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you're not going to probably shoot them on a 30 mile an hour, 40 mile an hour wind. You're not going to be up in the tree, mm -hmm. but that wind that's 12, 15 you know, 18 miles an hour, it's still kind of gusty, you're still going to be able to shoot them. I killed that seven-year-old on an east wind <laughs> in 2017. A couple of years ago, yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, that's my – like I said, it's, it's – <laughs> this, it, like, this makes so much sense, and I'm, like, kicking yeah. myself because there are so many times in the spots, southern Ohio, you get a southeast yeah. wind. Earlier in the season, there's just – you know, there's, there's typically hurricanes coming up the coast. Right. And southeast winds, and I'm like – I can't hunt southeast wind. I don't. Yeah. I'm not set up. I don't know what the deer's doing. I don't know yeah. this. I don't know that. Yeah. Golly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's dive into the the next thing. So, heard you kind of mention. Obviously, um, people can't read the woods as good as maybe uh, a couple decades ago. Um, one thing that you prioritized was how to read scrapes and correlating it to, you know, being successful hunting. Can you elaborate on that? Because there's a lot to that, and I'm sure there's, you know, many years of experience and thoughts to it. All right, he's grabbing something here. <laughs> what, are we, what are we grabbing, a book, a map? Awesome. Oh, we're getting a big oh, yeah. map. Let's, I'm, let's, we're diving into this. Let's clear some, clear some space out here. Last year when I finally do my, uh, my you know, that special that Iowa special Iowa tag of mine, you know, uh, I was hunting state ground, and my wife had gone with me in the spring, and she about tore her knee in, in half, and I had to put a splint on her leg and uh, carry her off the mountain, so to speak. That's just another one. And uh, But I had I'd gone, like, uh, let me flip this around. i just kind of give you a scenario. Um, Okay, this guy that uh, me and my wife met, uh, this uh, Paul Ebner, uh, he owned this uh, big farm over here and on the other side of this farm. And, but his property backed, backed up to the state game area. This, this whole area here is miles. It just goes all the way over to the east. And I was hunting, uh, actually where I shot my buck this past year was here. But the buck I want to I wanna talk to you about um, uh, totally relates to uh, the scrapes. So uh, there's only two access points. There's an access point uh, right here, and there's an access point here to the state game area. That's it. And then there's one over here all the way over to the east. And so I would walk in. We would park. Here's the parking lot right here. I would park right here, and the state has got all these food plots parked along the river. 
But where I had to go, this when I say this, uh, this topography was like straight up. It was like uh-huh. you know straight up. It was like my brother went went back with me in the spring, you know, just to scout. He was like, "You're gonna go up that?" I go, "Yeah, we're going up that." He goes, "No way!" Goes, yeah, we yeah, because I know if I didn't do it the first day with him, we wouldn't do it. Well, we actually found a scrape on this ridge line. You can kind of see how it kind of goes yeah. yep. all the way around right yep. here. Well, you had this scrape line, and it went from here, and it actually crossed, and it went down this bottom and came down through here. Actually, went on a private, and uh, so he was he was traveling. Well, there was a big uh, ten, and we had uh, a big twelve point. They actually both got wounded. But uh, how scrapes relate is that when you find a big like a big one, like there was this scrape that was right, like it's on my GPS, and. Uh, the scrape that I found right here was like, it was like massive. It was like, you know, one you just, and the smell in it was early. It was early. It was like we had gone uh, first week of uh, October. And uh, my brother was telling me, he says, you know, he said, you're not going to, you know, for that first week was like 30 degrees. I was the reason why we went. But I did, actually didn't get the activity until the second week I went, which was the first week of November. And uh, the scrapes on this ridge line were just like, uh, like off the charts. But both those bucks I wanted to hunt, both actually got shot and got wounded and never found. And so we would uh, gone in the spring. We went twice, and trying to find trying to find both those bucks. But um, I don't think either one of them was hurt, was either hit very hard. But they both were shot off of this. One was shot on this ridge line and it crossed over, and one was shot right next to me. But the scrapes were all the way up down this ridge and then went down. It was like one of the, the biggest scrape lines I had ever seen in my life. And I got uh, pictures of, uh, where's my. Uh... So did you find that scrape like the first week of October or was that from scouting? First week of October. Okay. Yeah. There were scrapes like this. This is on that ridge. All the way on this ridge, going all the way across, it was like this. I don't care. Where, this is down, and this was down on the bottom. Okay, there was hanging branches. It was like huge rubs. I mean, this is a small little buck, you know, underneath me that I passed up. I got uh, a couple one thirties. I got some video here, some bucks. This was a uh, actually uh, this was two and a half miles in, and this run right here. Uh, I thought for sure that I would shoot a bruiser buck off of this, but I was within probably 400 yards of scoring. Just didn't know because I didn't put. I had gone so far in there, so I didn't have to go any farther. But if, uh, when I went back shed hunting, I found that if I had just gone another four or 500 yards, I would have been in the primo spot. But uh, he just didn't make it to this spot. But it was it was like one spot that I really thought was going to pan out. Uh, this one here is another. Great, great spot uh, that I hunted out of right along the river. Probably got a couple of small ones here in the picture. But, I mean, I, I passed up deer. But the thing is, here's here's the big scrape. This was the one that, uh, this scrape right here, this was the one that got me all excited because I saw, you know, we had good uh, trail camera pictures, and uh, the scrape was massive. He had... Uh, the size of the track was just enormous. You can see his uh, urinated and pooped right in the in the. I mean, it was just, uh, and this was like uh, from my spot there. Probably that sc- that scrape was probably about uh, eighty yards, and my brother kept on telling me, you know that. This is where you want to be. You want to be down here. You want to be up on top. It's no, I want to be up on top, you know, because uh, that's where they're that's where they're going to cross, you know. If anything, they're mm-hmm. they're going to cross on top. But um, you know, it's the first time for me having to hunt out of the Mount Vernon area uh, in southern Ohio. It's the first time for me to really have to hunt that type of uh, really really heavy heavy, you know inclines you know elevation change elevation yeah. changes you know it was uh totally but scrapes are you know i use uh pre-orbital the smoky yep and uh that's all i use i got turned on to that many years ago been using that stuff i, I swear by it 
And uh, that's all I do. I just put, you know, a couple of drops on my wick, and that's it. And uh, the bucks are already, hit, are already hitting the scrapes. You know, they have been all summer. So when you're – how are you – when you're in the woods scouting, whether it's postseason, early season, or during season, whatever, um, how are you determining – what scrapes to set up on and what scrapes um, are, are not the right sign. Intel, intel. If I know that I have a buck that's been on that scrape, I've got a picture of him, or if I know that he's in the area, uh, you know, usually, uh, one, usually one of my scrapes usually gets taken over, you know. Now, field edges, um, uh, I want to see, like, uh, who's in the neighborhood is what I call it, basically. But the ones I put on the interior are the ones I'm going to hunt on. Uh, the ones on the outside don't really mean anything. They're like a, you know, like a boundary or secondary scrape, uh, just seeing what who's in the neighborhood. They leave their calling card. But uh, the one thing that I do probably is a little different than most guys is I don't put it. I don't use a, a urine or anything. I just open up the the ground, and uh, I just use a preorbital, and usually the dominant buck. Will, are, is the buck that'll open it up. I can't tell you how many pictures I have, you know, where younger bucks come in and they do the preorbital, you know, they'll rub their forehead on it and all that, but they don't urinate in it, okay? And, but an older buck will come in, usually the first thing he does, he touches right. his eye just for a second and then he's going to urinate in it. He's, he's going to leave his calling card. And that's the photo that I really want to see, you know, him there to repeat and come back. Mm -hmm. Because if I can get him to... Now, touch the one that's on the interior. It's just, it's, he's already made the mistake. Yeah. Very yeah. Good. Um, how, do you kill any deer right over scrapes? Are, are you hunting over scrapes? What's the percentage breakdown? Or, or give us an example of a, of a time where you found a scrape. I'd, I'd say it's like a um, little less than 50%, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. I think scrapes get, get oversold. The thing about scrapes, it's uh, it's the communication card. It's what keeps them in the area. You gotta remember, a buck at night, he's gonna hit that scrape more more so. Like probably, I find this to be true. He's gonna hit it more at night, but when he's going back to bed, if that's his home ground, he's he may hit it before he goes back to bed, and that's what I find. So you get a better chance for him in the morning than I think you do in the afternoon, even though. But I, you know, uh, the one buck that's on the bottom down there, I think on the far right, I shot him uh, on a scrape, and I shot him at like uh, 27 yards, right on a scrape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, you know, I put that to my advantage. You know, the way that that set, that whole set was set up, it was set up on a corridor. It was his travel route, and it was, you know, I put that scrape in like middle of summer, and so he was already hitting it during summertime. So I knew he was using it. It sounds like the two bucks you're hunting this year, you're already running mock scrapes for those. Walk us through how you've laid those out and how you plan on killing them with an association of the mock scrape, or are you just running cameras to keep tabs on them? Or? I have um, – I'm a little different. You know, I have uh, – uh, I use a, a broken uh, pine branch, mm -hmm. and I tie it and hang it down, let it hang down. Uh, vertically? Yeah, because where I'm hunting, uh, this buck – the the understory is so low, you just can't walk straight through it. And there's really not anything for those bucks really to have something tall. So I create on the edges, and I've got like this little spot where I've got this the, my first spot set up there is uh, they've been hitting it since like springtime, you know. And I do most of my scouting. Like all my scouting is done before the end of February. I'm done. Uh-huh. And, you know, all of my stuff that I do, like early spring, I, like once a month I go in to freshen things up. That's it. Like I was just in there this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to – I don't need to check it. I don't want to check it. I don't want to educate them. Yeah. It's been a common theme with almost every Michigan person uh, we've, we've talked to, and obviously pressure is key. Pressure is really key here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. I want to see – I, I want to make sure I don't miss anything here. We burned through a lot of those talking points that we had. I, here's, a, here's a question we've been asking some folks. When you're doing these setups, are you um, trying to – what would you prefer, height or cover in a 
stand location or saddle setup? If you had to pick one or the two, so cover. either cover. So okay, we that we haven't. That is one that's always up for debate. That's not a, usually a unanimous cover. decision. Cover. So cover. You'd rather be ten feet with really good cover versus. I'd rather foot be high. ambush uh, than you know uh, a billboard. Because you know if you're up in a tree and you're a billboard, you know uh, anybody can see you. Uh huh. You know the guy a mile away in his house sitting in his kitchen window looking out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, and the deer, they just know. You know, I mean, the deer that you don't see, see are half the time are seeing you. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're really loose with your movement and that type of stuff. You know, if you're really lax on that stuff. I'm pretty stealthy. I'm really, really. When I say I'm stealthy, I'm like, I'm like. <laughs> Tell us how it is. <laughs> yeah, how are you? <laughs> well, my son, I've been trying to get my son into hunting, and he, um, I said, okay, we're going to hunt this spot, and I said, we're going to go in. I said, but you're going to step exactly where I step, and there's once we get out of that creek, I says, when I say there's no talking, there's no talking. I says, if there's any talking, I'll whisper something to you, but that's about it. And I says, um, we're going to get about 80 yards from the stand, and I said, we're going to glass for about 10 or 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. So he goes, really? I go, yeah, really. You know, so we didn't even have a, a tree stand for him. Uh, so I put one of my lone wolves, one of my old uh, little small ones uh, on his back. And I said, we'll, we'll hang that, you know, when we get to the stand. So uh, the tree that I was in was a pretty good size oak. And uh, so a good cover to stand behind, you know, once we got to it. But we're glassing. I says, now this is the spot where I always glass the deer. And sometimes I have to sit here and wait 45 minutes for them to, to, to move on or get up from their bed or decide that I can't hunt. Mm-hmm. So I said, we'll see what happens, right? So we got got there. We waited about 10 minutes. Glass, glass, couldn't see any deer. We got to the base of the tree, and I looked about 40 yards, and there was three does bedded down from us. They never heard us, never saw us. Wow. Now, there's a reason why they didn't hear us and they didn't see us, Okay. So before the season, uh, like I'll go in there uh, sometime in September, and that last 100 yards, I take a little rake, you know, a little plastic rake like this, and I rake out a path going to my, to my tree. Every twig is off of that path. I make no noise. So I get to that spot. They don't hear anything. How slow are you walking that last 100 yards or that last 50 yards? That's something I, should, I, get, I get in a rush. <sighs> slow. Mm-hmm. It, as it's long all, as it takes. As long as it takes. Because a lot of times I'm stopping, I'm leaning up against a tree, and I'm glassing as I'm going. And I just don't want to spook a deer. Because most cases, when you're going into a bedding area where you know there's a spot where they bed, you're going to spook a deer. Okay? But if they're not bedded there, you, you won't see them. You just have to spend the time. Most cases, like you say, if you're in a rush, mm-hmm. you're going to spook them. You're going, I busted one. That's the big thing, right? I busted one. Well, if you bust a doe, it's not, not a huge deal, but it could be. Mm-hmm. You know, it's better not to bust them. You know, you're yeah. better off just to be patient and just wait. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten to a stand. My buddy lives uh, lived a mile and a half from our farm, and he had moved. And so he gave me the key to the place to manage his farm for him, and his farm was behind my farm a mile and a half away. And so I was hunting at his place, and sometimes it would take me, when I got to his back pasture, I would say, in some cases, it would take me 20 minutes to get back to where my stand was at because there's just so many deer back in there. You know, I didn't want to bust anything, you know. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times you're you're just trying to minimize, you know, all the damage you can do. The big thing is, is once you do that on a repeated basis, like if you do that once in two weeks, it's really not going to bother the deer. But if you do it like three days in a row, now, now they're hip. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Anything else you can think of? Yeah, I got. I, right. Yeah. There's. I mean, <laughs> I like to. I, I appreciate what you're talking about, Perry. Um, there's. I, I don't know if you remind me of my my granddad a little bit or, or what it is, but <laughs> I, I could. We could stay here for another four or five hours. Like I, I'm really enjoying the conversation. There's one. There's one thing specific that I do want to ask, and then if um, I know we've been going for a while, so if we want to wrap it up, we can. We can wrap it up. I think Cameron has a question too. Um, the one thing. And this is kind of controversial. Um, some guys are do or die. Some guys believe in it. Some guys say it doesn't do anything. And then some guys are in the middle. I'm one of those guys that are in the middle because I'm trying to figure out 
you know, if there's any truth to it. And that is, so the topic is the moon and whether or not, not only moon phase, but also the transit time have anything to do with deer movement. You know, um, I really think it has a great effect, my personal feeling. Um, you know, the moon guide came out, and, of course, we always had, you know, that data. That data was always out there, and fishermen have always used that data, you know. So, to me, uh, it's all relative. Um, it's like, it's just another tool. You know, if, um, I know that, uh, like, Today, when I, this morning when I got up, the moon was right here, right? And I'm thinking hunting situation, you know? So I knew this would have been a perfect morning to be out uh, because that moon would have been like, you know, it's... It's like, high in the sky. It's high o in the sky. O overhead, yeah. Overhead. And uh, it to me, since I've been following the, the guide probably the last, uh, I want to say three years, I've I've always used the moon to my advantage for a lot of years, but now you know um, since they came out with the product, it's so easy to have, you know, stuff it in your backpack, have it on hand. I've bought them, given them out to my friends uh, every year. You know, the moon guys like they just had the two for one offer. You know, um, but I think it's good data to share because it's it can put you into a situation where you may not be hunting that day uh, or thinking in those terms. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, using one of the, you know, A, B, or C principles of where you're going to mm -hmm, go, mm -hmm. you know, and I think uh, I think it does correlate. I really do. So you're looking at the transit times, which would be overhead, underfoot, the rise. Morning and evening. Yes. More so for morning. Hmm. I think uh, mornings have probably the, the bigger push. Um, I think um, my philosophy is this. Early season, like September 15th, you're not going to change a buck's mind, okay? But as soon as the beans harden, October 1st, he's totally changed his mind. What he did September 15th and what he's doing October 1st are usually two different things. So you have, in my opinion, three days to hunt him and kill him. That's it. Other than that, you got to wait till the 28th. That's, that's another common theme that we've heard here in Michigan. You have three days, and then you're waiting to... Late yeah. October. Yeah. You're waiting till, till late October. That's not from, that's just from my experience, owning my own farm. Manage and help other people manage their, their farms, how to set them up, how to put in food sources. You know, Michigan is a state where, you know, you have, you know, just so much hunting pressure, you know. It's like if uh, you go over here to the Holly State game area, which is just, you know, six miles down the road, right? It's 1,200 acres. When I first moved here a year and a half ago, I literally spent three days walking that whole thing. There's no roads in it. I walked, I marked every tree stand that was left. I marked every feeder. I marked every salt. Look, I marked everything I could find, every rub I could find. Could not find one major rub from an older buck. Not one. Not a one. What does it tell you? A lot of hunting pressure, you know. You know, if you're finding a rub that's on something that big, uh, that's a yearling. He's he's not exciting me, okay? Right. But if I find something that's substantial, that's a signpost rub, then, okay, I got to investigate. I got to find out how this buck is traveling. You know, mm -hmm. that's one of the other bucks that, that I have that's not too far from here. That's in another state game area. Like, this one buck that I'm going to be hunting, I have to say that he's never been hunted. Now, you would say, and I'm going to say that there's, tree stands that are within four or 500 yards where I'm going to be hunting. Okay. And well, how could you say that? Well, this buck has been so comfortable where he's at because it's so wet. He doesn't have to worry about anybody stopping on him because no one's going to go, go out there and, and go through the cattails, go through the water and go out to his bed. He's just got to, he, he's, he's not coming out until it's time to come out. Period. Yeah. You know. Standing there until dark. Right. Well, I, my personal feeling is, is that when the, when you have like at seven in the morning, when you have that moon and it's in eyesight right above you, 
uh, the Bucks are, are moving to 11 o'clock in the morning. And typically they don't. And, uh, like Michigan, Bucks really start moving well before 10 o'clock. They're usually bedded down, but go to Iowa, and they're moving to 2 o'clock. Okay. Again, it's, it's age structure and competition. When you don't have the competition, like if another buck, no, if you got a four or five year old buck and he's in the bachelor group and he's got, you know, a bunch of yearlings with him, let's say, and a one, two year old, <laughs> he's not getting up to wrestle. <laughs> what for? Right. You know, not going to do it. Yeah. There's no reason for him to do it. So, uh, I think it just helps that movement when it's overhead in the afternoon. But I think the big one is the morning, especially here in Michigan. I think that that is where you get a buck that makes a mistake, Mm -hmm. you know, is on that moon. And that is coming, is that coming back to bed later or is that coming back to bed? And because there's an overhead moon, he's out milling around, maybe venturing a little further away from that bedding area. I I don't think it has anything to do with, uh, uh, with betting. What I think it has to do with is bachelor group splitting up. And now they're trying to decide what their territory is going to be. It's kind of like a doe in the springtime. She's looking for fawning cover, the best screening cover she can find. And she's going to take over that ground. Now you got in this section, you got five bucks, but you only have one three-year-old. The rest are all, you know, yearling bucks. Well, He's going he's gonna to take the best ground, this three-year-old. These guys over here, they're going to be just milling around. The bachelor group is busted up. That's what's going on. And this is what they don't talk about. This is what they don't write about. You know, I never see an article written about, you know, bachelor group just breaking up and why and who's taking over what. You know, the other big factor I'll tell you is this, is that if you hunt in a state like Ohio, you got more of a chance of older bucks competing against each other. Okay, in a given area, you're only going to have the hierarchy is kind of decided in the summertime during velvet. They really don't have to hit horns that hard or anything like that. They just know by their demeanor. Okay, most I would say 60 to 70 percent of the bucks are wimps. (laughs) Okay, I really mean that they're wimps. They're pussies. They don't (laughs) want to fight like if they come out into a field. And they see, like, a decoy. Oh, I don't want to mess with that. Okay, it's not just the decoy. Or they see another real buck in the field. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a dominant buck and a dominant buck come into the same field and one tucks his tail and runs. Why? He doesn't want to fight. He's a pussy. <laughs> he's, not, he, he's not fighting. No, he's running. And that buck, he may have the best set of headgear. Now, here's the thing. Those bucks that have the biggest set of headgear that run and tuck their tail, they're the hardest to hunt. They are the hardest to hunt because they're going to go find themselves a secluded spot. They're not, you got to remember, they're get, not only are they getting bullied from the girls, they're getting bullied from the food source, okay? So they're not allowed to go in and eat the food source. Like if it's a heavy white oak, uh, oak crop, you know, He's going to get pushed out because he, everyone knows he's a pussy, even though he's got a big set, big set of antlers. And this sounds funny, but it's really the way that it works. So he's the last one typically to come out, and he's the last one to feed. He's the last one to feed. He's the last one to breed, if he breeds at all. That's, a, that's an interesting perspective is going back to, to the, almost the betting hierarchy of those bucks. Like we talk about that a lot in the office of, uh, you know, the betting structure of a whitetail herd on, on a parcel and that certain oldest, most mature deer or you know, whatever, the most dominant deer on that property, whatever, if he's 150 inches or 130 inches, yeah. he's taking that best spot and it might not always be the deer with the, you know, the biggest rack. Mm-hmm. Um, Can't remember, like in a, it doesn't take uh, long, uh, like for a deer to go from one mile to the next mile section, it's two minutes. If you got one dominant buck in a oh. section, if you're not seeing a lot like your typical deer, you're not seeing their typical bucks in a given area, it's used because that big buck has moved in. If he hasn't been there, or if he, if you know he is there, he's kicked everybody else out. And he's just sitting back chewing his cud. Somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. 
Yeah. I know, Jake, you've had that yeah. occurrence on, on a couple of different times yeah. on trail camera with deer coming in. Last, uh, or it would have been two winters ago, uh, really good scrape on an edge of doe bedding, uh, high deer population, mm-hmm. and uh, it was in January. And I killed this deer last year, came back 10 and a half years old. Uh, but that was him at nine years old, and he was 160 inch, 165 inch deer. Yeah, uh, gnarly. Came in and uh, well, actually, another deer, real fat, big fat nine pointer. It's <laughs> the best way to describe him. Just right. Illinois big fat deer. Came in, hit this scrape. Do I? Which one hit him? <laughs> I feel like I'm getting a goofed up. Long story short, the the nine year old, much bigger. He hit that scrape very gingerly, tail tucked, like mm-hmm. you know, real nervous. And then the other deer came in and worked that scrape right afterwards. And um, when I killed him, he was all by himself and was yeah. opening up a scrape on. I killed him on November 3rd, and he was opening up scrapes. And uh, he wasn't a deer I had it on camera often. He was very <laughs> difficult to hunt. I knew he had to be in the area because I'd get him on camera every now and then. But um, that's interesting to see that direct correlation with what you're saying. I've seen that uh, with my own eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron wants to know about woodsmanship. Um, you, you know, through today or this afternoon, You've mentioned several times that you feel like that's a lot. Woodsmanship is a lost art in today's whitetail culture. You're a big advocate for scouting, small game hunting, um, you know, learning the craft of of a hunter and almost um, taking small game hunting um, through some type of mentorship or some type of, um, I don't know what the right word is. Just build the foundation, <laughs> yes. foundational right. blocks of a... See, then, well, I, when I was a young guy, young kid... I mean, the foundation was taking us uh, rabbit hunting, pheasant hunting here in Michigan, especially pheasant hunting. And um, that just graduated us as we got older, like 10, 11, 12 years old, and then start looking at, you know, deer hunting. You know, I remember being like uh, probably 9, 10 years old, and, oh, you're not old enough to go up to the UP yet. You yeah. know, you got to wait. You It know? was almost you, a passage to Manway. Right, a passage to Manway. And, uh, you know, when you got up to the UP, you got to learn how to, you know, chop wood. You got to learn how to, you know, read, you know, uh, find rubs. I mean, that was one of the biggest things that we did was go out and try to find, you know, rub lines and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, just having to know how to lay the land, reading a compass, uh, all the starting a fire, uh, kindling, you know. I mean, you, you wrap all that stuff when you learn as a kid. Now kids are learning, well, I got to go to Cabela's or I got to go to Bass Pro, you know, or I got to go, I got to go get my food plot seed because I got to go get my food plot in because the only way I'm going to shoot a deer is on a food plot. Uh-huh. That's the farthest thing from the truth. The, the biggest thing we can teach our kids is, you know, is not necessarily hunting just from an elevated tree stand. It's teaching them how to hunt from the ground in security cover, how to build a blind. You know, all those little things, those little mentorship things that you teach, give them skills like tying like certain knots, you know, and uh, like how you can uh, build a wall with just taking one little piece of rope, tying them together with this knot. How, how, Grandpa, how did you do that? Can you show me how to do that? Well, we're not teaching those skills. We're teaching them that we go spend $50 on a bag of seed, we put it in a food plot, and we sit in a box, and that's hunting. Not to say there's nothing bad with that. That's what the industry is. But we're we're missing the boat in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, I feel like we have, like when I small game hunted, I had a, a sixth sense. Like when I was with my dog and I'm hunting with my shotgun, I, I could feel like, all right, guys, there's, there's a bird right here. That, that sixth sense. And we don't have the reason why we don't have that anymore is because we've taken away from the actual culture of knowing what that feels like to be, let's say, hunting over a dog or hunting in a field. And you're trying to, you know, bust a a pheasant or you're up in the UP and you're trying to bust a grouse or a woodcock, you know, stuff like that. Uh, It's just like um, for me, I could be sitting in my in my tree stand and I have a. I just have a, a canning ability. My wife will tell you. I can tell you what could happen in what's going to happen in the future. But I'll be sitting there, and I go, it'll be like two o'clock or two thirteen, and I go, there's going to be a buck coming through in like ten minutes, and all of a sudden it just happens. Uh, I think it's we've kind of schooled it out of us and how we're trained, and I think there's 
there's somehow we're connected to that sixth sense. And the farther that we're, we learn in, you know, the cement city in that culture, the more we get away from that. So when I say the woodmanship, the woodmanship teaches you all these things that you ought to, that you're connected equally to the environment. You're part of the ecosystem. You're part of the management. You know, you're part of the solution. You're not the problem. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're certainly not, you know, someone who's trying to wreck, you know, the environment. You're someone who's trying to give back to the environment, you know. And if we, if we focused if we could take the hunting industry and get our hunting industry looking at, you know, uh, finding ways to educate our kids to where they want to give back to the habitat, they want to give back to the resource, you know, not just take from it, you know, it's like, do you want to be served by others or do you want to serve others? You know, well, I was taught, you know, at my age when I was a young kid to serve others first and never stick your hand out, mm -hmm. you know, so... There's a lot of things that we can teach the kids. We just need to get them, you know, thinking about how do we how do we teach a, a 20 year old <laughs> that yeah, hasn't well, figured that out? Yeah, that's that that's I guess you know that's part of Cameron's question. So, for someone who is new to hunting, whether it's whitetail hunting, small game hunting, or whatever, where would you point them to? Um, I guess obtain that mentorship, or maybe it's a book that they can pick up off the shelf and read. I would say um, there's. It's hard to get a hold of now, but uh, Roger Roth here being, in my opinion, the greatest whitetail hunter of all time, um, in our lifetime anyway, in this century, uh, in pursuit of trophy whitetails is uh, the uh, the book for a hunter in hunter's terms to learn the craft, not only of you know Buck's behavior uh, and uh, his demeanor and how he acts, but also about the habitat and, you know, fringe, you know, how, you know, different habitat types, you know, fringe differences and so forth, how to recognize that. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's there's been a lot of good books. Um, I think uh, Miller's had uh, a number of good books in whitetail hunting. Of course, Eberhardt, you know, here in Michigan, you know, uh, I'm a published author, uh, but I'm not a published author uh, in uh, hunting, you would think I would be, because I'm probably more knowledgeable. Uh, but I, uh, I'm, I'm published in an, in another uh, genre. What is it? What is it? It's, 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 I'll give you, a, I'll give you a copy. Uh, it's um, Walking On: Why Attitude, Servitude, and Gratitude Trump Everything Else in Life. And it's about you know uh, taking what you know, uh, recognizing you know your your good points, your failures, and uh, chalking it all up. You know, work for God. You know, there's only one person we kneel to, and that's him. We don't kneel to, to any government. You know, all, all the stuff that's going on in our country right now should not be happening. You know, uh, there's a lot of good people in our country, and uh, we we need to be patriots. We need to be proud of America. We need to be proud of what we stand for. We need to be proud that we've protected all these other countries for a lot of years. And I don't mean to get, you know, <laughs> political, but, you know, there's so many things that, that's going on that's it's not part of, it's not part of who we are. We don't burn things. You know, I don't see conservatives burning things. You know what I mean? To get their point across. I see them, okay, I agree to disagree. Is that book on like on sale on Amazon or anything like that? Uh, we we have uh, copies. We'll give you a couple. Well, uh, we no. want to sell yeah. some for you. Yeah, we want to. <laughs> it, it's been on Amazon. Yeah, okay. it's it's been about uh, six, seven years ago I, I wrote it. And uh, did a lot of speaking after it first came out. We've we've gifted more copies, uh, or we've gifted probably just as many copies as we sold. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm that just a, that type of person. Mm -hmm. I'd rather give than receive. I, and I always tell people once I give the book out, you know, especially if it's someone that's hurting, uh, passing on to the next person you know that could use a lift. Mm -hmm. You know, that's cool. But uh, I mentioned QDMA in there, and I mentioned uh, some of my uh, yeah. You work for a nonprofit. That's that's yeah. on yeah. On the work for a nonprofit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope we cross cross paths here, but Chad, there's, there's one more there's question. There's one more. Th no, well, no, it's not a question. Okay. So one of the most interesting things was, um, you know, you had reached out with the whitetail crib stuff that we were doing, and I don't, you know, Cameron can probably explain this a little bit better than me, but being in the office that we're always communicating and talking about different things, you signed your email, um, you know, Perry Silvio, 
May the spirit of the whitetail forever enrich your, your soul. Is, is, <laughs> is, 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 that, is that what it was? May the magic of the whitetail always enrich your life. Yes. That's it right there. May the magic of the whitetail forever enrich your life. So Cameron just showed me that. Uh, so I had it all screwed up. But <laughs> that simple line is what got us excited about coming to Michigan yeah. to sit down with you. Wow. Um, um, that really makes so me feel how, proud. How do you, how, what is the, what's the story behind that? Well, you know, I was uh, traveling all over and doing all these seminars for QDMA, and we were uh, up in Clare, and I had a fellow walk up to me, and, you know, and I was, like, shocked. He goes, uh, can I get your autograph? And I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 my wife's not even asked me for my autograph. Even though, you know, I always say, you know, I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> I said, you, you want my autograph? He goes, yeah, I want your autograph. He gave me like uh, four of our magazines. And the only thing I could think of is what Roger used to tell me, Roger Rother used to say to me all the time. You know, all the conversations I had, he used to use that, that byline all the time. So that always kind of hung with me. And uh, so was, there's only, out of all these years, there's only been one person, because I'm on two forums. I'm on the Saddle Hunter Forum, and I'm on Archery Talk. And, uh, you know, guys really don't know who I am. And so, you know, a lot of times on the forums, they'll say, go look at this guy. I think he really knows what he's talking about, <laughs> you know. And I just like, to, I, like I always say to the young guys, hey, I like to share my knowledge, you know, and help you, you know, tag that buck of a lifetime because, you know, it was hard knocks for me. It was a school of hard knocks here in Michigan. I didn't have, you know, like a mentor that just hung over my shoulder on every hunt. I, you know, I had to figure things out myself. And I'm the type of person that, you know, I'm not fearful of much. In fact, nothing. And so, you know, I learned uh, – what uh, cured me of my fear of the darkness was going to the UP hunting whitetails because these would drop me off at like 4.30 in the morning in the dark with no flashlight. <laughs> so after that first week at uh, 12 years old, I was no longer afraid of the dark, <laughs> sitting in the dark. <laughs> so, you know, go sit over there and wait for it to get light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. Yeah. Well, well, we have to hit the road yet, but I um, – do you travel to any shows or anything? Or I mean, we'll have to we'll just have to have keep an open dialogue and see if we can do a a, a part two of this because I feel yeah it was so impromptu that if we did some more planning I think we could go into depth in, in some of these topics. Yeah. More. there's a lot Absolutely. of there's a lot of stuff that I've written about. Uh, stop, you know, things that uh, uh, I've actually written about too. You know that uh, we could really share and uh, you know I'm probably real related to like the older school guy that you know, hunted uh, whitetails the hard way, you know, when we didn't have all the things that we have today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's that's for the better, you know, because it, it, it taught a craft that uh, just wasn't centered around a gimmick, you know, or a gadget or, you know, this or that, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, I mean, you could talk about, we could talk about scrapes a heck of a lot more. We could talk about calling a heck of a lot more, you know. We could talk about travel patterns a lot more. If we can talk about how population dynamics really changes, you know, uh, any property uh, from one year to the next. It's not just the food source. It's the population dynamics that re actually resist there. You know, yeah. And that's another t that's another topic. But I'm going to go back and listen to this. I'm going to write all those down. Yeah, there's and, a podcast yeah, on every episode. And, probably. and we'll do that. So, yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, what's your hand? Do you have a? Can, do you want to share your username on Archery Talk and and uh, Saddle Hunter or? I'm a CCC Card Carrying Conservative. Uh huh. Uh, on uh, Archery Talk and uh, everyone knows me on Saddle Hunter as Silvio. Okay. So, on uh, the Saddle Hunter, uh, I share a lot of uh, innovations. You know, a lot of the guys uh, have used my stuff. Uh, we all. It's a real. It's a great community. Uh, the Saddle Hunter community, I got to say, is the best forum in the USA. <laughs> I'll be damned. <laughs> it is. It, it just is. I mean, there's there's no arguing. There's um, It's all sharing information. It's, you know, certain guys have started their companies through, you know, talking and guys sharing how to 
weld things or how to make things or, you know, a lot of us older guys, you know, we have a lot of skills that the younger guys don't have, you know, and especially when it comes to manufacturing and see, seeing things in 3D and how to go about it, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, and I love helping the guys that are DIYers because, uh, you know, they're, they're the next innovation that's going to come down the pike, mm-hmm. you know, is helping these guys think a little differently, you know. And, uh, but it is, it's a great form. Like I say, it's uh, the guys really want to give back to the community, you know, because the Saddle Hunter community is a small community. There's not many of us. And uh, and I think the trend's going to be that you guys won't be hunting out of tree stands probably five years from now. You're going to be hunting out of some form of saddle because it's going to make more sense. It's going to make it's a lot more sense. We already are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to call it quits. All right. Thank you so much. Check out your Whitetail Cribs episode. And uh, until next time. All right. Thanks, guys. It's great.